A man is a wolf rather than a man to another man when he hasn't yet found out what he's like. Plautus, asinaria. Hello again. Let's continue our journey with the valiant Hidalgo and his savvy squire. Chapter 26 tells of the spectacle of Melisendra's liberty. Note that Cervantes has added yet another narrative frame. A young assistant narrates the actions of the puppets who are controlled by Master Pedro. Cervantes is at his best again as he makes a puppet show come to life before our eyes. Melisendra's rescue from captivity in more controlled Zaragoza by her husband Gaiferos is a happy version of Montesinos' tragic story of Durandarte and Belerma. It is gripping and funny at the same time. The humor again derives from contrasts between an intense melodramatic fantasy and its mundane and even offensive details. For example, the narrator begins by citing Virgil's Aeneid when the Trojan hero tells his story to his Carthaginian audience. All fell silent, Tyrians and Trojans together. Epic sounds of artillery and trumpets emanate from beneath the stage, but then Master Pedro's assistant tells us that Gaiferos is playing, of all things, backgammon, when the Emperor Charlemagne chastises him for not rescuing his own wife. Similarly, the assistant calls Charlemagne the putative father of our Melisendra, meaning he is not her real father, but also insinuating prostitution. Another prosaic detail, Gaiferos asks his cousin Roland to loan him his sword, Durindana, for the adventure, but he refuses. Note the Freudian maneuvers in this story. The entire episode is a projection of Don Quixote's own journey to Zaragoza. There are also echoes of the Cave of Montesinos adventure. Here, Roland's sword is actually named. In other words, Cervantes understood well the distortions of the French epic tradition that turned out the figure of Durandarte in the Spanish ballad tradition. Similarly, when Gaiferos rejects Roland's help, he alludes to Don Quixote's subterranean experience. Rather, he says that he alone is enough to rescue his wife, even if she is being held deep in the center of the earth. And all of this complicates the matter of ethnicity. Family lines are confusing and Moors and Franks are in close sexual proximity. For example, a Moor steals a kiss from Melisendra and she reacts violently. Behold how he kisses her right on the lips and the quickness with which she spits and wipes them with the white sleeve of her blouse. Did you know? At the Battle of Poitiers in 732, French forces stopped the Muslim invasion of Europe. Another comical aspect of the show appears in the numerous interruptions of the narrative given by the assistant, who wanders off after details that interest neither Don Quixote nor Master Pedro. Again, Cervantes mocks certain readers' impatience with his own style of storytelling. Don Quixote objects, Follow your story in a straight line and stay away from curves and perpendiculars. So does Master Pedro. Continue with your simple song and avoid counterpoints. But what distracts the assistant is fundamental information about how Spaniards viewed their conflict with Islam. For example, he describes the punishment of the Moor who dared to kiss Melisendra, noting that the Moorish king of Zaragoza ordered him to suffer 200 lashes in public. His point is that the Moors did not follow any formal rule of law allowing the accused the right to legal self-defense because they have no indictment of the accused or detention with evidence like we do. It's funny, but recall that Don Quixote thinks Master Pedro should be tried by the Inquisition. So Gaiferos rescues his wife from a prison tower in Zaragoza and dashes off toward Paris. But the Moors sound the alarm. Already the city echoes with the sounds of the bells which ring out from all the towers of the mosques. This is a problem. Christians had bell towers. Moors used 
drums. Don Quixote knows this and objects to the cultural inaccuracy. Master Pedro is most improperly inclined concerning these bells. Without a doubt, this is great nonsense. Master Pedro has to convince Don Quixote that, as with modern theater productions, a certain amount of poetic license should be allowed. Don Quixote accepts Master Pedro's argument, but when the assistant describes the Moorish knights of Zaragoza chasing after Gaiferos and Melisendra, it is simply too much for our Hidalgo. Like Gulliver in the land of the Lilliputians, Don Quixote draws his sword and attacks Master Pedro's show. With swift and never-before-seen fury, he began to rain down blows on the Moorish puppetry. Master Pedro is distraught. They're not really Moors, but pasteboard figures. Oh, sinner that I am, you are destroying and doing away with everything I own. With historical irony, Master Pedro acts as if he were the last Gothic King Rodrigo who lost Spain to the Moors. Quixotic Mission What punishment does the Moor who dares to kiss Melisendra receive? A. 100 bites B. 300 tickles C. 200 lashes Correct answer, C. 200 lashes The remainder of the chapter involves a detailed negotiation of Don Quixote's payment for the damages he has caused Master Pedro. The new bourgeois world imposes its values on the old. Don Quixote attributes his confusion to his enemy enchanters, but in the end, he is willing to pay more than Master Pedro asks. The innkeeper, and surprisingly, Sancho, are now arbiters in the settling of accounts. Don't cry, Master Pedro, nor wail, for you're breaking my heart, because I'll have you know that my Lord Don Quixote is such a Catholic and scrupulous Christian that as soon as he comprehends that he has done you wrong, he will make it known to you and he'll want to pay and satisfy you with interest even. Don Quixote even adds two reales for the effort of recovering the monkey who has escaped during the confusion. He then pays for everyone's dinner. All dined in peace and good company at the expense of Don Quixote, who was liberal in the extreme. And finally, he gives the poor page a dozen reales as he goes off to war. It's just like the end of part one. The destruction caused by chivalric fantasy is all made good by a bourgeois miracle. That's all for now. Find out what happens with our characters in our next discussion of this fascinating text. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here. Thank you.